I think with this panel, we'll bring it more to the political realm and talk more about uh, why there seems to be a disconnect between uh, the public's awareness uh, of the fact that we're that we have a problem, uh, and even uh, apparently it, it seemed uh, with, with 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 Senator uh, Warner and Senator Kuhn said today that, that a lot of people in Congress understand uh, that there's a problem, and yet somehow the policies were were, were, were slow walking. Uh, the actual development and implementation of meaningful policies. Um, and what we'd like to do is um, have more of a discussion, an informal discussion, rather than a series of, of presentations. And um, I will introduce the panel now. The good thing is this, this will go rel relatively quickly because uh, you already know three of them. Uh, uh, John and Tom and Peter have already uh, spoken to you, um, so I will introduce uh, Rana uh, Forovar. She is the assistant managing editor of uh, Time Magazine. Um, she's a veteran international economics correspondent. She was at Newsweek uh, for a number of years uh, in Europe, uh, I think based in London. And uh, while she was there, she was uh, awarded the uh, German Marshall Fund's uh, Peter White's Prize for transatlantic reporting. Uh, she was a general editor at Newsweek and various other publications. Um, she is uh, a 1992 graduate of Barnard <coughs> College, Columbia University, uh, with a BA in English Literature. And she's a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations. And uh, Rob and I have uh, talked to her in the past and have been very impressed with her uh, insights on sort of where the U.S. fits in the global marketplace. So I'm sure her insights will be very valuable, as will Peters as a journalist and our two uh, policy experts. Um, so when we get started, let me just you know, offer sort of a, a general observation about what we've seen so far today or heard so far. Um, I was really struck by John Zogby's uh, the, the responses to the polling questions, because it's clear that the public understands that 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 we're slipping, that we need to be more innovative, that we need to step up our adoption of technology and our education. And but what also struck me, there was a certain maybe complacency, because the polling question about China, there was this overwhelming sort of understanding or acceptance. Uh, that China is going to eclipse us. And I'm wondering if that is an indicator that maybe uh, we're not paranoid enough. Um, I think, uh, you know, paraphrasing uh, Andy Grove that, you know, to be successful, you have to be a little paranoid. And in the past, I, we were good at, par at being at paranoid, at paranoid. Uh, the Sputnik, uh, you know, Japan Inc in the late 1980s. We responded uh, rather dramatically. Uh, we made investments um, across education, and uh, R&D. And we, we, we made those investments, and it paid off. Now, I, it seems there is, on one hand, an awareness that we are also, that we are once again being challenged, and yet frozen, we're paralyzed in being able to do something about it. So why don't I just use that observation to maybe kick off the discussion. And um, I would invite uh, any of our panelists to, to comment on this, whether we have maybe, we're not scared of it. We're not as concerned as we should be. Um, I'd be happy to jump in on that. Um, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, I've spent actually a lot of time in China in the last four or five years um, because it's such an important part of the economic story. And, I, I, you know, I mean, I also lived through, I had a father who was an immigrant and started a small manufacturing business in the Midwest and lived through sort of the fear that Japan was going to take over the world. He actually made me start taking Japanese lessons when I was 12 um, because he was so worried about this. I think that there's an element of that 
in the China fears as well. I mean, I think when I go and see local companies in China uh, from the ground up, I don't see as much innovation happening at that level as you might think. But on the other hand, what China has is a national strategy. Now, you can argue about whether it's the right one or not, but when edicts come down, they, things get done. And I think that's what we're talking about here. But I want to just make another observation and share with everyone here um, something that, that sort of dawned on me. I was attending the World Economic Forum in Davos in January, and um, you know, not a lot gets done there, but it is a kind of good finger to the wind about issues that are bubbling up in the global economy and, and policy directions. And one of the things that really struck me is I think we are at a possible real change moment around this whole debate because the gentleman earlier who flagged um, the, the bifurcation between the fortunes of, of countries and of companies and of the people that work for them, I think that that is the heart of the matter. And I think that there's this growing understanding that policymakers, for a variety of reasons, not just in the US, but all over the world, have their hands tied. There's debt, there's, there's political fracture, there's gridlock. Um, so, you know, they're sort of beleaguered, they're depressed, they're, there's, there's, it's difficult to create, excuse me, create action. But on the other hand, companies, uh, particularly Fortune 5 are doing very well, in part because they can kind of float above these national concerns. And what I heard there was a worry from a lot of those companies about how they could get more involved in things like education and competitiveness, because I think that they're starting to realize that there is a tragedy of the commons that's going to happen if they don't get serious about it. And I think that that, um, if I'll just go on for another minute about this, I think that you can see that in the debate that sprung up uh, a couple of months ago. There was a big article in the New York Times where an executive from Apple was quoted as saying that Americans' problems were not Apple's problems. Now, that's just one person's view, and I think that you know, a lot of people in the company probably wouldn't agree with that, but, but that's one end of the spectrum. And then the other end of the spectrum is what Roosevelt Moss Cantor was talking about earlier, about companies like IBM, for example, um, I happen to have written about that program that she was talking about, P-TECH, which is a um, collaboration between IBM, um, Department of Education in New York City, and the City College. A company like that that understands that you do have to support local economies and local markets in order to re remain robust, in order to fill the skills gap. And so I think that that coming together, that public-private coming together, is starting to happen, and I think the most fertile area for it is education. In all the reporting I've done in the last six months to a year, I'd say, talking to companies like IBM, talking to companies like Caterpillar. I was out speaking to Caterpillar in Peoria about a month ago. These companies are frantic about finding the right kind of talent, be it um, engineers that are coming up with the, the next great thing, great idea, or uh, technicians, welders, who understand how to, to uh, work with the most complex robotics equipment. They're training, and just on their own, um, developing partnerships often with local colleges. I'm sure that many of you know more about this than I do, but I think that that is a real area where we're going to see movement. And in fact, I got a, an email a little while ago that Arnie Duncan was actually doing his own press conference right now, talking about how to roll out the P-TECH model um, more nationally. So I think that that's an area of hope. Um, let me, let me, two areas you mentioned, just to follow up on China. And I said, so, so you're exactly right, right? China has been very successful in accumulating capital. <coughs> China has been very, is that working? Yeah. Uh, China has been very successful in accumulating capital. Nobody's done anything like it in the last 20 years. Faces a series of challenges that are different than the challenges it faced. Switching to a consumer-led economy, dealing with income disparity, both in cities and between geographic regions, thinking about how its companies can be successful in global commerce in a way they've not been, um, dealing with the fact that China will not be the, is, no, is no longer the low-cost manufacturing place as wages in China increase, and trying to move its way up the value chain. These are very big challenges. We don't know what's going to happen, but we do know innovation would be an answer to probably most of them. Which brings us back to the challenge in the United States. It seems to me that a critical element of innovation policy going forward has to be, and I think you, you made this point wrong, not just the country, but the people in the country. And I say it this way. The economy has grown largely through productivity increases, which in turn largely driven by innovation over the last decades. 
But 2013 is the 40th year of a critical moment in American economic history. In 1973, when real wages reached their peak, right, the average wages for American workers have never been as high as they were in 1973. There was a significant break in family income growth, which had doubled since the end of the world of World War II, grew much more slowly, and income disparity began. In other words, from about 1947 to about 1975, the different quintiles of economic strata grew at roughly the same rate in income from the mid 70s on. There's a dispersion, and this brings me back right to where you are. I think it brings us back to skills. We have to do many things, but if we want the country to benefit, if we want productivity to fuel job creation, then skills and I think emphasis on advanced manufacturing, where labor costs are not as big a percentage of a company's total cost as they might be in other forms of manufacturing, become actually critical elements to have an innovation policy that disperses very broad benefits. I, I, I actually, I, mean, I think, I think, uh, just to be very brief about that, I, I think, as Steve, I think the predicate of the question was a little, a little overstated. Um, uh, you know, are we not, I mean, you know, well, one of the answers, I think one of the answers to one of those poll questions was that 75% of people, if I remember correctly, thought, you know, China would be leading in, uh, in technology or IT in five years. I'm not an expert on China, but I don't think anybody who is an expert on China thinks that's remotely close to uh, to the way things are. Um, and you know, before you know, obviously we need, I think we need to take into account the effect of all our policies on innovation, but we also need to to also you know not not um, you know if you look look at uh, Chuck Holton's statistics that were that were. Um, Presented before, and I, can, you know, I think there's no reason not to believe them. I think you know that we're not doing so badly. Now that doesn't mean we're always going to continue doing well. And maybe in the last couple of years, you know, that we're just, we're, we're not, we don't have data. Maybe maybe they're not going to show the same the same thing. But we, you know, I, I don't think we got to remember we are in the middle of a very bad economic patch generally, and. Uh, Lots of lots of proposals about how to get out out of it, uh, probably, and not that much consensus. But I don't know that I would, you know, overreact and call it a, you know, that's largely an innovation problem. I um, think that we here in this room all like innovation. We probably wouldn't be here if we didn't, but. We speak about it as if, well, innovation, everybody knows what that is, everybody knows why that's a good thing. And yet, I think one of the reasons that it's so hard to, for people to, like IPI, have to advance their agenda is that if you dig down, you discover that not everybody has the same idea in mind when they hear the word innovation and also what you would want to do to generate it. And so instead of trying to help achieve some kind of consensus, I thought I would just lay out what some of the divisions are in the minds of maybe people in this room and people outside this room on all different aspects of innovation. Just It helps to think about that because it could be that somebody whom you're, whom you're speaking to, you're assuming you have a common ground, and yet you really don't when you, when you get right down to it. So just a few just a few kind of dividing lines on this issue. One is, what is innovation? We have basic R&D, you know, telescopes pointed towards, you know, distant galaxies, and we have kind of ornamentation, and, and on ornamentation, I just want to pull up my prop of the day, bring the camera in close on this, because I stayed overnight in a hotel, and I used, Laboratoire Remed Complete Repair Conditioner Shine Enhancing Volumizing Hair Clarifier with Sweet Lupine Complex Panphenol Citrus Extracts and Mint Oil. And you can probably tell all the way from there 
what it did to my hair. It worked. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I'm a beneficiary of innovation. But, so we have this. We have what is innovation after all? Is it, is it this, what I have in my breast pocket here and I'm going to keep with me for a while now? Or is it, is it the basic R&D or, or somewhere in between? If so, where in between? Another issue with innovation, there are people who would say that uh, innovation is all about product differentiation, market segmentation in order to uh, reduce the price elasticity of demand and give market power. And that's, that's, you you want to show that your product is just enough different that you're not competing with the product next to it on the store shelf. And this goes back to books like The Hidden Persuaders of Vance Packer of the 1950s. And so people would say, innovation, all we need is one you know, brand of flour. So it's crazy, but you can see why innovation is not an unalloyed good in the minds of many. Um, another issue, uh, we talked about this a little bit, intellectual property protection. Uh, some people would say it's a good thing we had uh, a speaker from, what's the name of the organization? Uh, computer Communication. Right. Talking about sometimes there can be too much intellectual property protection and the <laughs> thicket of patents in, in the computer and software field has actually made innovations difficult and caused all these <clears throat> unproductive acquisitions which are serially for the purpose of of adding to a war chest of patents so that you can cross license and, and avoid uh, litigation that's going to knock your product out of the market. Uh, so, if, so, and yet you don't want no protection. So where is that? And people disagree about that. And I think until you start having those basic discussions, then you're going to get, con you're not going to be able to reach uh, progress on the uh, final outcomes. Uh, another one. Where does innovation come from? Uh, we've, we've heard talk about, you know, the Instagrams of the world, just bought by Facebook for a billion dollars, uh, created, you know, a classic couple guys, just put this thing together and suddenly it's worth a billion dollars. Uh, and, you know, is that the model for, for innovation? Or is, or do you go back to the theory that innovation, the real innovation, the serious stuff, has to come from kind of large companies with market power that can produce the profits that will um, allow them to staff up the R&D labs so that, you know, the new book out on about Bell Labs, for example, uh, and that, and that not, after at and lost its monopoly, Bell Labs kind of withered away and, and, that, and a critical loss of American competitiveness with it. And then just one last point, uh, Rob Atkinson and the ITIF are very strong on the idea of connecting innovation to production. And I just wrote something in the magazine about uh, the, the importance of manufacturing. And Gene Sperling, the National Economic Council chief, uh, had a speech about that last month in Washington. And yet there are others, uh, you know, serious economists like Christina Romer, um, who could hardly be uh, labeled an anti-government type, who, who say, uh, you know, government does not, should not play a role in kind of steering resources or policy towards helping manufacturing because there's really no need to, that, that innovation is innovation and it doesn't require that linkage to manufacturing. So uh, this is just, you know, typical journalistic bomb throwing, trying to split up consensuses instead of building them, but I think it's worth talking about. <laughs> Can I do the half full stuff? Sure. So, uh, to your question, right, I mean, it was the, uh, uh, to your initial question, it was the, I believe, well-known economist, Satchel Page, who said, don't look back, they may be gaining on you. <laughs> that, that may be the one form of political impetus that works here, but as I listen to the conversations today, I think I heard talk about emerging consensus, and I wouldn't say full consensus, on issues that included incentivizing startup businesses, immigration reform, trade policy, which we've had some successes in the last two years, 
discussions of rationalizing corporate taxation, including the rate and R&D tax credit, a lot of emphasis on STEM and skills. So while I agree with you, each one of the each one of your points is right, and we could discuss each one of them for a long time and try to be, and be better educated for it. I do think, in the spirit of the title of the conference on the big screen in the back, that we we should note that there do seem to be these areas, and that if we make progress on these, we could make a lot of progress, and we could also at the same time focus on the outliers. So manufacturing, look, I, to me. There is substantial evidence of the relationship between manufacturing, high-skilled jobs, and uh, R&D presence. So does that, to me, the question therefore is less, is manufacturing a good thing? We are, I believe, the second biggest manufacturing in the globe today, even with the decline. But it's more, how do we deal with manufacturing? And I think, maybe I'll come back to this later, but to the extent we are building on regional economic strengths, I'm a big believer in the sort of regional innovation clusters, to the extent we're building on regional economic strengths that really exist, that aren't artificial, but that need support to build up sort of an ecosystem of success, and that those can include advanced manufacturing. The way Youngstown made a transition from manufacturing tires to advanced polymers, that I think is a good and small policy. Tom. Let me just, uh, it's, more, it's almost a question rather than, let me just talk about one issue that I think actually there's pretty widespread consensus on what should be done, but, and there has been fairly widespread consensus for quite a while, but, but not a lot of progress, and that's, and that's um, the high skills immigration issue. Yeah. Very few people who, I mean, at least in this community, think it's not a good idea. I mean, it really, it really, I mean, I think the arguments about it, the, you know, uh, killing domestic jobs have, have largely been debunked, I think. The right? yeah, evidence shows not only would it not kill jobs, it would, it would create new jobs, I and mean, you're importing a bunch of human capital, which is going to increase demand. I mean, there's even, uh, we did some work at TPI, Arlene Holland, who's here, showing that, uh, you know, that um, uh, relaxing restrictions on high school immigration would, would probably, you know, because these people pay a lot of taxes and they don't require a lot of government expenditures, you know, could probably account for a fairly large amount of deficit reduction, like on the order of $100 billion over, over 10 years. Um, but, so this seems like kind of a win-win situation, okay, which to me is the definition of what a prerequisite for consensus. <laughs> um, now obviously it's been tied to the general immigration debate, and, and at least in terms of legislation seems, I mean, what people tell you who are closer to it than I am, is, it's, you know, it's not going to move by itself. It'll move, it'll move as part of that, and, you know, but, so, I mean, that seems to be something that there's a lot of consensus on, but it's, but it's hard to separate it out and kind of... I would just add one thing that I'm completely, I imagine like everybody in the room for stapling a green car to, to high-skill visas, but I think also um, it's about creating an environment in which those people want to stay here. I mean, you know, and I'll, I'll tell this again through a personal lens because I'm the daughter of someone who came to MIT on a full scholarship and then started a business and stayed in the U.S. because that was where you wanted to be when you came from Turkey in the 1960s. If it was today, I'm not so sure. You know, when I visit these countries, I see a lot more opportunities. I mean, if that was me, I might make the choice to go back to Istanbul or, or Ankara, and, you know, or you know, if I was Chinese, get $100,000 as a sea turtle and go back to Beijing and start a business. So I think that that's an important part of it, too, and I, I'm sure everybody agrees on that. Yeah. One thing, it, I, Peter, I think you brought up a very, uh, very important point. I mean, um, I can't tell you how many times um, I've had to explain to people what ITIF does because the, they say, well, what do you mean innovation? So it is a good question. But one of the things that, even if there is consensus, uh, I wonder if um, this involves national strategy national policy and run I propose something mean, you said do are we still thinking maybe in terms of companies 
mm -hmm. uh, states. I was thinking what Senator Warner said before about the state. And, and do we think maybe too regionally, too locally, uh, too much in terms of companies? And are we skeptical um, about the way we can form and implement policy at a national level? Do we just no longer think we can do it in Washington? Well, I'll just comment quickly because I do have a, a thought on this. Um, I think that we need some rebranding of, of words and vocabulary around this issue. I mean, Peter kind of touched on some of the fact that even the idea of innovation, it, it's, a, it's a kind of a nebulous concept. What does it mean? Um, what are we talking about? I think when we talk about national competitiveness, and I'm going to use a third rail word here, industrial policy, you know, eek. Um, <laughs> I think I'm going to lose half the audience right away, maybe. But um, I think that these words, be it laissez-faire or industrial policy, they, they bring up emotions and they immediately kind of bifurcate people. And I think that we need to rethink about what does that really mean? Is industrial policy, is it about picking winners? Not necessarily. Is it about incredibly um, better metrics and, and tracking uh, patents and where IP is coming from and who owns it and connecting those people in a smarter way? Maybe. So perhaps that's a discussion to be had. Okay. Tom, um, and I will say we'd like to bring in the audience. Uh, you're all very informed people, even more informed than when you walked in here at 845 today. So uh, you know, think about some questions. We'll be sure to recognize you as soon as possible. Tom? We'll talk about that. I should mention other, I mean, there's lots of things that have an impact on innovation that actually, you know, a lot of things were talked about during the course of the day. Um, and particularly kind of, you know, for example, and things that I think people don't normally think of as innovation policies, but I actually think should be thought of that way. Um, and particularly in the IT world that I uh, kind of study. And, 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 one, and a prime example that I think really should be considered uh, innovation policy is privacy policy um, and it, it also you know impacts our kind of our international competitiveness there's a there's a you know virtually all innovation on the internet makes use of personal information in one way or the other okay. either to develop the product improve it search engine is a prime example or to uh, through advertising to generate the funding for it since privacy policy, broadly speaking, is restrict, essentially restricts either the ability to collect or use information, it is going to have an impact, and potentially quite a big impact, on the um, on the uh, either the magnitude, the magnitude or the or the direction of, inno of the innovation on the internet, and. You can kind of, and, and it also, I mean, you, you look, there's, you know, broadly speaking, there's two approaches to privacy. There's kind of the European approach, which is more regulatory and more restrictive, and the, there's the U.S. approach, which is, is more light-handed. I mean, there is a reason, there's, there's more than one reason, but one of the reasons, I think, that, you know, all of these, all of the, all of the great IT companies have developed here, rather than in Europe, is you know, and that's at the core of innovation. I've got to see innovation a lot broader, but I think these things should be thought of as, as innovation issues. With that, why don't we uh, open up the discussion to the audience. So if you uh, have a question, identify yourself, and we'll bring you into the conversation. Yes, sir. Thank you. Margaret Strike with the National Academies. Where does one begin? Uh, innovation takes place in a very complex, dynamic social environment. And many researchers have pointed out it's not just the inventions, it's not just uh, seeing what could be done with it, that we typically think of with innovation, but it's the whole environment in which it takes place. The availability of venture capital, of bankruptcy laws uh, that are more lenient here in, in Europe. Uh, the uh, uh, business processes that Chuck Holton has pointed out to that uh, uh, actually form creative use. You mentioned the Bell Rest, beautiful example. Uh, it's a very complex system. You want to advance an agenda. Uh, where do you begin? 
So, uh, it, it, one has to begin hundreds of places. So, uh, Phil Weiser and I from the University of Colorado Law School, now the dean, and I put out a little paper last fall, which we said, look, everybody understands certain things have to be done right. The economy has to work, there has to be functioning capital markets, there has to be rule of law, there needs to be education. But what are other things? And, and, and let me just note three, some of which have been talked about. Uh, it, it, the point about immigration, everybody agrees with it, it's got to get done. It's crazy to have people say, we want to help make America strong, and we say, thank you, no. It's just crazy, right? Secondly, focus on basic R&D. We just know, I mean, your Bell Labs example, the book that's now just out, people talk about Xerox Park, right? It's not getting done in the way it used to get done in America. Maybe that's because American companies are more competitive in some ways. But basic R&D has got to get done. We don't know where it's going to lead, and that's actually a good thing. It depoliticizes the funding. The third piece, and I mentioned before, is I think we need to understand that the U.S. economy is made up of a series of regional economies that have different strengths. And that in Silicon Valley is, of course, the best example. But lots of works in places like Denver, San Diego, Research Triangle, Boston, and Biotech. I mentioned Toledo before. Uh, Pittsburgh around innovation. I think federal policy ought to reorient itself to supporting these ecosystems because they contain the elements to which you address. In other words, there are businesses, there's the potential for positive spillover, there's connections with big universities, there's connections to community colleges. It's already in place, but it isn't fully maximized. And so the federal government not trying to do top-down management, but trying to support bottom-up processes that are in place but can expand into better markets or adjacent markets, strikes me as a very highly leveraged way to use very scarce federal dollars. And by the way, <coughs> we'll come to it, it would allow the federal government to reorganize itself in a way that would be more efficient and I think more productive. So that's not a full <coughs> answer because your question is correctly all-encompassing. But if we did those kinds of things, I, I think we would find we had a more effective federal <coughs> presence. Good insights. Does, does everybody want to comment, or do we want to move to another question? OK, go ahead. I'd just like to take two quick comments. One is my father was a pioneer uh, at Bell Labs with 90 patents. And he had the original patent on the push button telephone in 1935, and I didn't get mine until 65. <laughs> And I asked him why not. He said, well, the warehouse is full of functioning black dial phones. Why would we want to throw them out? Mm -hmm. So you have that. But Bell Labs was made a monopoly by Congress. I then went on to work for IBM and worked with IBM Research. And what was interesting at IBM was it struggled that it had big machines, little machines, and small machines. And they were all competing in the marketplace where you had people with big machines that wanted to move down to middle machines, but they didn't have a common software. I mean, there are all of these kinds of things that come into play. And it's, it's all about jobs. I mean, I, the, the head of manufacturing at IBM when I went up and suggested we ought to do some activity-based costing, he said, let's see, why would we want to think about that? He said, we've already, um, we've already figured out what our metric is, which is speed. And I said, well, there's this organization that's starting to look at it, can we join? He said, why would we want to do that? We never learned from anybody else. They only learned from us. Yeah. It wasn't until IBM finally lost $8 million for the very first time, and it got an C a CEO from outside. But if you read the Bell Labs books, it'll talk about the leadership. If you read the new one about the American icon, icon leadership makes a real difference whether it's political or corporate, and we sort of forget about that. Well, <clears throat> Bell, I mean, it, uh, Bell Labs was a, a byproduct of having a regulated monopoly phone company, which I think, and, and, probably, and, and the fact that you had to wait 40 years for the push button phone was also a product of having a regulated monopoly phone company. So I don't think necessarily that's, that's the way to stimulate R&D. Yeah. There's pros and cons to it. Here, do you want to I, say? I, this is not apropos of a question, but just 
because I want to say it. <laughs> uh, I just read a book called Why Nations Fail, and I reviewed it in the issue of Business Week coming out today, and I really liked it. It's by Duran Chemalu from MIT and James Robinson from Harvard. Uh, he's a political scientist. Robinson is a political scientist, and Chemalu is a very prominent economist. And the part of it is a sprawling book. The part of it I want to get into is this issue of industrial policy and innovation, uh, because. And then I want to contrast it with another book, which I'm really in the middle of reading now by a woman named Ann Lee from New York University, uh, called What uh, the U.S. Can Learn from China. And these books are completely disagree with each other, so it's kind of interesting that way. Uh, Chen Lu's point of view is that China is an extractive economy um, in which the leadership s continues to try to maintain control of the people, it's obviously not as a totalitarian, it's not a totalitarian country the way it was under Mao, but it um, it's going to hit a ceiling on growth because uh, extractive economies, uh, top-down economies, uh, hate creative destruction, and creative destruction is essential for innovation. That's kind of what innovation is in a way, creative destruction. And Lee's point of view, that's why I tend toward that point of view, but just to give the counter, uh, and Lee's point of view is look, look at the enormous strides China has made, and she believes it can continue to make those strides because the people of China are moving together forward with a concerted plan that everyone buys into. They're investing, uh, clearly they're investing, and she says they're also innovating, and that Innovation is consistent with uh, the harmonious government. You know, harmonious is the word that comes straight out of Confucianism, and it's been adopted by the Chinese leadership. Uh, innovation does not require creative destruction, at least on a national scale. That it, it can be born out of uh, a harmonious economy that happens to be not fully democratic. So, I don't. Want to? I just kind of putting it out there to see if people here, up here, or in the audience, have anything to say about that. Well, I'll just comment quickly. Um, I think your point about China is, is extremely interesting because I think you can write any China story two ways. Um, uh, and but but to me, I think what the connective tissue is between the problems that China is facing and the problems that the U.S. face. It's, it's short-termism versus long-termism, right? And, and at the national level, in some senses, you do have a very long-term view in China, right? There are five-year plans that get executed. I think there's a huge existential crisis right now going on, which you can see on the front page of the papers with this kind of crazy uh, movie-like uh, scandal at the top tier of the Politburo. And I won't sidetrack into that, but it is great reading. Um, but I think that in China, the short-termism issues and, and I asked this question of a business professor recently in Beijing. I said, why hasn't China invented the iPad? And why are you not even close to doing that, really? And he said, well, there's so much political risk, and there's so much of a sense of in the private sector, you've got to get in, get out, and get yours while, while the getting is good. You're never going to have a kind of a Japanese style or a German style or at the best a US style company at this stage that spends years training managers and developing products and has a 30-year view. So I think that that's very interesting. So I think China grapples with short-termism in that way. I think here in the US, we grapple with it in part because of pressure from Wall Street. I mean, I've, I've been very interested in um, the, the Kaufman Foundation uh, studies around entrepreneurship versus the size of the financial sector uh, in this country. And you can basically see as finance takes off, new business goes flat and then, and then falls. And so I think that, that that's something that we need to talk about, too. And I'm, I'm not a huge fan of trying to craft regulation to curb behavior, but I think noticing those trends and thinking about how to, um, how to move forward is, is a good idea. Do you have a comment on that? Uh, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you for the, the, the comments. I uh, it got me thinking. I was immediately when people raised my hand and they said, which direction do you think innovation policy in this country is going backwards or forwards? And I, and I, Thinking backwards, and you look at the problems in the IP system, you look at the problems of inability to separate high-skilled immigration debate from the toxic overall immigration debate, 
and just the or you know basic R and D funding from the larger topic of wasteful government spending, you kind of have a negative view of things. But one of the things that America still does well is is the culture of innovation, at least in Silicon Valley. And uh, there was a book 15 years ago or so written by Annalise Saxonian, you know, Comparative Advantage. And it looked at two different case studies, if you will. So it's not perfect, you know, regression analysis, but it took root 128 corridor in Boston compared to Silicon Valley in the very similar setups. And Route 128 corridor at Harvard and Cambridge and access to venture capital. So you have those two things there. And in Silicon Valley, you very much have this, a similar setup of venture capital and uh, good educational institutions. And it came down to, at least one of the things that came down to her was culture. And part of this was the inability or the lack of enforcement or inability to enforce uh, non-compete clauses in California compared to Boston. And, it, and she kind of took that into this, this exposition on kind of the chaotic trading and cross-pollination of ideas that happened in Silicon Valley, where the Boston model is more stovepipes. And I was wondering if you guys could comment on your thoughts on, on the culture of innovation and how important that is. It seems like we still, compared to China, for example, we still have, we're still the top country in the world for that, and this kind of disruptive innovation, the willing to take risks, the willing to take chances, the willing to disrupt the status quo. So I mean, it seems like culture is one of the things that's not talked about, but it's very much important. So I want to say a little about political culture, but before I use your question to answer a question that hasn't been asked, does anybody want to talk specifically about innovation culture that he asked about? Otherwise, I'll, Tom, do you want to do that? Well, look, we have the most innovative culture in the world, and, and we're going to still have it, and her work is important. And another aspect of her work that we ought to talk about, and it goes to your personal stories, are the connections that get made between immigrants and the countries from which the, the countries of origin, which can be very strong connections in, in a global economy. But I want to go to political culture. So, let's think for a, mil for a minute about the Peloponnesian War. This has been bothering me. Here's why. the other question. Socrates, Socrates <laughs> takes from the Peloponnesian War that democracy can't work because it's messy. It's divisive, it's inefficient, and one's adversaries know everything that's going on because it's open. He tells Plato, Plato says, great, philosopher kings, get rid of this democracy stuff. Okay? Powerful philosophical tradition comes from Socrates' belief that Athens doesn't manage the Peloponnesian War very well. I want to talk about our political culture. We are in a moment where, by every measure, all the national elections are very close, right? The president has a lead in a rolling average of polls that's within the margin of error. The Republicans in the House have a generic ballot advantage within the margin of error. Recent <coughs> takes at the Senate show it could be 51, 49, either way. Maybe more likely Republican, but could go either way. And of course, it could go 50, 50, which means whatever way the presidential race could. There's two ways to look at this. We could look at this this as a moment of profound division. Or we could say there's a group of people who want jobs and don't know which political party can deliver it the best. They should make their choices. We all have our own uh, candidate in November. But I think it's the people in this room that can shape the political culture. Because it's got to get done one person at a time that says after the decisions get made, We've got to figure out a way to find consensus and find some common ground. And I don't mean this in a Pollyannish way, right? We're not all going to get guitars and start singing Kumbaya. But we can be <coughs> practical minded politicians to show the world how leadership can come from democracy for economic advantage. I think that's a central challenge we face, and I think it's a cultural, not just a political question. <coughs> Thank you. While you're being passed the mic, I would just comment that I, I think that it gets to hearing a lot today about process and about innovation ecosystems, and it's how you do it. It's not always about a huge expenditure uh, of money or a radical change in public policy. A lot of times it is incremental, smart thinking 
along the edges and maybe if uh, uh, we do have the wallet and we just have to find the political will and that's what elections are all about. Uh, thanks. Uh, well, Peter, your mention of harmonious uh, in context of new books uh, brings to mind a uh, recent publication uh, jointly uh, put out by the World Bank and the Development Research Center at the yeah, State Council of the People's okay. Republic of China, China 2030, Building a Modern, Harmonious, and Creative uh, Income in Society. In that uh, uh, publication, there was joint agreement, apparently, that China's growth is going to fall by half over the next uh, decade and a half. Um, they have a table showing that uh, uh, road GDP growth uh, had been uh, in the order of 10% a year uh, between 95 and 2010. By the period 2026 to 30, it's going to fall to 5%. Uh, and I think this is a reminder that when we're talking about China and the U.S., we're talking about two countries in various, uh, very different stages in their evolution. And one final comment, there's this well-known uh, growth economist named Angus Madison, who made the heroic effort of estimating GDPs uh, in the world uh, over the last 500 years. And Madison's results show that in the 16th century, he points out that the two unambiguous world leaders with 50% of the world GDP were China and India. Yeah. The 1600s? Another question, yes, sir. I'm sorry. Raise your hand again, please. Yeah. Okay. I think what the U.S. needs to do is get rid of provincialism. When uh, Mitt Romney was in, on his way to South Carolina, he called Obama a European president. In South Carolina, jobs are driven by BMW, Daimler-Benz, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You've got to get this provincialism out of out of the dialogue. In other words, you, you have to say that we do we do have an interdependency between government and business. Because if we don't, and there's been all kinds of studies, there's a study by Chung Li at Brookings, who who did a study of the Chinese we call them the Chinese turtles and the Chinese seagulls. The Chinese students that come here and stay for a long time, but the Chinese could go back. Four billionaires left. Silicon Valley to go back to China and start innovation there. So the innovation really starts in America, but it's continuing overseas because we have closed minds here. Go ahead and the panel want to comment on it. I mean, I, that goes exactly to, to my point. I think that, you know, um, it's about creating a landscape in which those people want to stay. Um, because the rise of the rest has happened, is happening. Um, I, I do think, I mean, to your point, the gentleman's point earlier about China's growth falling, I don't know if it's going to fall to 5%. It is falling, as are most of, as is most growth in the emerging markets. I think that that's actually a big marker that's happening right now, is that that growth story is somewhat over. At least those countries are hitting the sort of middle income barriers um, that's going to make growth more challenging, and that does change the landscape. But at the same time, it means that they've risen to a level in which there are just tremendous opportunities in these places, and it really puts the pressure on the U.S. to, to be the, the, the home of choice to innovators. Okay. Did you have a comment, Jeff? No. Uh, uh, let's do uh, two more questions. Um, okay. Yes, sir. In the third row, actually. Um, yes. Behind me. We can switch. <laughs> Thank you. I'm from Norway. And I have been working about 12 years in European Commission, European Union programs. And I've run some of them. And we've been trying to catch up with America. And billions and billions of euro at European Union level, as well as national level, including in Scandinavia. Our company, we launched the big concept, uh, knowledge society and economy and society. Okay. 12 years ago, Europe will be the most vibrant knowledge-based economy and society. Uh, we revised that. And today, whether in Scandinavia or in Germany or in France, and the same in Japan, I'm 
being involved in Japan, we realized that we had to come to the United States to learn what, how to build knowledge-based economy and society, and to reinvent ourselves. I agree with BMW and many others, but Europe today is stuck in what is called knowledge society, multicultural society. We can't absorb millions and millions of other cultures. You might know better than I know this. So I still believe that if you mobilize, as my question and statement, knowledge for local communities, the plumbers of knowledge society, there are a lot of jobs to be created to empower local communities, to create jobs, to educate, and to invite foreigners today. I've been traveling, working with Boston Consulting quite a few times here, but the last five years, you are so pessimistic. You get me even the impression that you, you're afraid of yourself. <laughs> uh, I'm invited in China to uh, help them organize the first World <coughs> Congress of Cultural and Creative Industries. 90% uh, of my input is from America. So to get down to your local communities, your districts, your villages, and don't look otherwise. China is not threatening. They need you. Uh, last comment, the last book by the chief economist of the World Bank. I just spent some time this week with him about new structural economies. Now, when it's about how to do it, he comes to the United States. So, I think you should shake up a little bit and to see that it's still it's, it's, it's here. It's not Google and uh, Facebook. It's local community, your brilliant society, multicultural one, and uh, I benefited myself. So it's still in America. Don't be in the face of China, even for America. Those are encouraging observations. Does anybody want to comment on that? We should go to our next question. Well, I, how to follow that is uh, pretty amazing. But one of the things that, that I'm struck with, whenever we talk about innovation, one of the things we tend to talk about a lot, well, first of all, the rest of the world, and we talk about innovation the way it used to be. For example, the incredible stories of Bell Labs and, and <coughs> IBM Watson Labs and things like that. Well, there's lots of people who've written about why you know, the Bell Labs suddenly had to be under quarterly profits, et cetera. But that is not the real reason that we lost some of the uh, identity of Bell Labs. The fact of the matter is, we are in a world where you cannot be number one in everything anymore. The whole principle of the major labs, Watson Labs is a key example, Bell Labs, Xerox Park, was that you could be number one in everything. And therefore, you could create an environment with physics and science and everything that then would be the engine. The fact is, innovation has changed. Nobody can be number one. Nobody has the ability to have all of the R&D curves and not leverage on the R&D of all the other people around them. So when we talk about innovation, Peter, I think you're right. We have to really be careful what it is we're talking about, because innovation is a forward-looking thing, fundamentally. Also, it is a matter of individuals. Initiatives do not create innovation. Programs do not create innovation. Desire doesn't create innovation. Individuals within a context create innovation. And incremental things create innovation that then makes the discovery. So it seems to me that part of the challenge is we need to rethink what it is we're talking about, what the timelines really are. It's no longer true that basic research to market, it takes 10 to 15 years. And the reason is not because we're faster, but it's because we're doing different things. If I develop a new algorithm and discover a new way of doing things, I had to write the software to do it. And guess what? I'm already in applied research. So what are the boundaries? We need to discipline ourselves to think a little cerebrally on this and real, realize that we're innovating in another way in another time for another reason. Let me just say something about the last two comments because it's very helpful and we appreciate people coming and sharing ideas with us. One link I might make between the, the, the last two is that uh, sometimes we, 
when we talk about regional economies, we lose sight of the notion of comparative advantage. Europe has put a lot of research um, into thinking about what different parts of Europe are good at. Different parts of America have thought about that, right? Not every place in the world is going to be the world's leading biotech cluster. But, uh, and therefore, understanding strategic advantage is very important. I, I do think it has to be built on a base of R&D, basic R&D. But I think the last two comments tie together with that notion, which is extremely helpful to us. Anyone else? Okay. Um, with all the discussion about international competition, I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that uh, ICIF is hosting uh, uh, an event on the Export-Import Bank uh, on t uh, next Tuesday on Capitol Hill. You can check our website for more information on that. should be a good uh, debate. Um, and I think with that, we'll wrap up. It just seems to me that, you know, what we learned today was that this country still has a lot of talent, uh, it has resources, uh, it has the right culture. Uh, maybe what we need is a little bit more awareness of where we are, where we need to go, and a little bit more consensus on how to get there. And I hope uh, we make some strides in both those areas today. So on behalf of Rob Atkinson, who just walked in, and uh, our co-hosts and our other panelists in this panel and from this morning, thanks very much. Thank you.